to the tune of 800 milligram eight hour day or even more. And at that point of time, the cost also is a big issue. And we can definitely try uh, the newer sucroferic oxide. Uh, thank you, sir. But it's only cleared in the dialysis phase for patients. That is, uh, the FDA has cleared in only for the use of the dialysis population. That is, sometimes we do have patients who have got a very high phosphorus level who are still not yet started on a dialysis program. Uh, what does generally everyone feel? Agree with sir, disagree, or partially agree? We have been using this drug for the difficult to control uh, hyperphosphatemia. And along with, you know, we have patients with hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia. So we don't use a full dose event to start off. We've been using 500 mg twice daily, along with uh, maybe a calcium based phosphate binder. So uh, some calcium can go up along. Sometimes occasionally we use, still use uh, vitamin D and log also. <clears throat> And diarrhea has been uh, been a problem. And what we have done is we have discontinued the drug for those patients who have been unable to manage the diarrhea. But we have not rechallenged that. So we have a few patients who had diarrhea, maybe less than 10 percent, whom we have to stop this drug. One else wants to tell us about uh, their experience with the drug and where they've used it. I, I have used it, uh, like I'm uh, Dr. Manjunath from uh, Mangalore. Hi, uh, hi. I, uh, hi, hi, sir. Uh, I have used in uh, around 10 to 15 patients as a primary drug for patients who are CKD who are initiated on dialysis. And some patients whom uh, the phosphorus was not controlled with uh, Cevalamar because of increased pill burden. So as a primary drug, I find it good because... Uh, uh, it uh, the amount of uh, drug which is required, like it binds to around 260 milligram of phosphorus, one gram of tablet. So around uh, three 400 milligram per day uh, can be taken care of uh, with three tablets. Uh, so this is a significant benefit of uh, that drug, and it's hardly in any part of the drug is absorbed. So there is no risk fear of uh, toxicity. So probably patients who can afford this uh, drug can significantly reduce the pill burden because many of these our dialysis patients as you are aware will be on uh, many of uh, antihypertensives and uh, many other drugs which they will be taking uh, probably reduction in uh, number of pills will make a significant uh, difference in their uh, and many of them are on twice a week dialysis uh, i don't know how it works in other uh, settings so most of, most of the patients are on uh, twice a week dialysis so for them also uh, this, um, uh, the, this drug is uh, significantly helpful in uh, uh, a reduction of uh, hyperphosphatemia. Uh, hi, sir. I am Dr. Subramanian from Trichy. Uh, I would just like to share my experience. I have been using this drug as first line therapy for some of my hemodialysis patients as de novo therapy. And I find that it works well. The reduction in serum phosphate level is good. But what I find is uh, we cater to uh, a low middle economic uh, class of patients. So the cost is the only prohibitive factor, otherwise it's a wonderful drug idea. Sir, I'm Ranjini from Chennai, hello. Uh, my experience with the drug is also quite thin. I have used it around uh, six to seven patients on uh, dialysis. Uh, actually, we didn't have, uh, well, I didn't have to use that uh, thrice per day. I was able to get away with uh, two roses per day as a first line agent for dialysis patients. And also I've concentrated uh, on th those who have not been able to control their phosphorus well. So uh, in two or three pa patients, it was advantage uh, when I had used this drug as a first line uh, um, and I was able to control the phosphorus well in them. So also the pill button is less and also the cost factor is one thing I think which over a period of time I think should come down further. Professor Donald said about how this drug, if it we start and then we continue, uh, would but uh, some of us would be using it like you know like we use albumin, sorry al uh, uh, aluminium for example, you know for a short while to control the phosphorus and then stop. 
what is the general feeling should we start and stop or should we just continue what is the general feeling of what we are practical for us in uh, in when there's uh, cost constraints what does everyone feel about that i think i would use it for quite some time until the serum phosphorus target is reached and maybe i would opt to uh, choose to another agent that is commonly used like sevalamide or another cost effective agent for that matter Uh, Dr. Mamit sir, you said about uh, using it along with uh, uh, calcium acetate for those who have got hypocalcemia and uh, hyperphosphatemia. Uh, sir said about uh, choosing uh, uh, calcitriol or uh, you know a vitamin D analog along with uh, along with uh, this phosphate binder. Uh, what is general feeling? It's a little counter counterintuitive, right, to give a, a vitamin D analog when this phosphorus is also high. So, what do you? Dr. Maman sir, what do you feel about that? Like I've been using calcium acetate and uh, this uh, SFO rather than using uh, vitamin D. Or even vitamin D we generally use once the phosphate levels have come down. Yes. Not otherwise. So that has been my strategy though the experience is limited to about 20 patients or so, so far. And this combining with the uh, calcium acetate and uh, SFO seems to be a better choice than vitamin D as of now. I don't know. We'll have to go up and see what the future uh, results are like. How do you go about this, Santosh? Sorry, sir. How do you how how do you deal with yeah, such patients? You know, I I I would think that uh, I, I would think that we should uh, tackle the two separately. Giving the calcitriol when the phosphorus is high may not maybe actually uh, counter counterproductive. I feel, yeah. So I quite agree with you, sir. I have another another uh, question for all of us. When we uh, when we switch. From one drug to the other, do you take off the old phosphate binder or do we add it in a small dose? What is the general what is the general practice been? If somebody is already on Sevilama, like say 800 milligram three times a day, do we add a 500 of this or do we take off the Sevilama, make it or make it 400 and then do what is the general practice been? The number of patients I have tried this actually I had stopped Sevilama and shifted. But the basic issue is GI upset is very, very difficult to control. Most of the patients, once we switch, complain of this. And some people even have this nausea vomiting, which was actually not reported in the study. Study said only diarrhea. But, and Sevalamar produced more of GI upsets. But probably we are not going to the tune of 800 milligram hourly in most of our patients. That's why they are tolerating Sevalamar better. But the, uh, when you give 500 milligram eight hourly, definitely the patient will have GI. So you're saying stop the sevilama and then give the uh, SFO. Any uh, concurrence or disagreement with sir's suggestion? No, I uh, I agree with sir, sir's suggestion. Uh, add, uh, stop, remove everything because it's very potent. Uh, so re remove, stop other drugs, start uh, uh, SFOH alone. And then see how uh, phosphorus control uh, comes over a period of uh, a month. And then in case required, they can add. Because main aim is to reduce the pill burden. Yeah, that is very true. Sir, uh, I have a question to Dr. Santosh, if I am allowed. It's not about uh, sucroferic oxyhydroxide, but there is a general guideline that now the, there is a paradigm shift. Like we are generally preferring non-calcium containing phosphate binder because of uh, increased uh, chance of vascular calcification. So in CMC, do you still use calcium carbonate and calcium acetate or have you switched over to non-calcium containing phosphate binders? So that's a very loaded question for various things. So last time I was, I think it was, uh, I think it was ISN or Southern chapter. I was doing a debate that I was speaking against calcium, uh, calcium containing phosphate binders. And I think it was Southern chapter, yeah. And uh, I was speaking against calcium containing phosphate binders. And, uh, no, sorry, it was ISN. 
I said, yeah, and the and my opposing person uh, was picking up again uh, for calcium. So uh, basically, uh, the literature actually all the literature is like about calcium carbonate, which we don't use. The little bit of data that is available for calcium acetate actually shows it in a favorable light. If you if you look at the data for calcium, the it's when you combine all the data together. it shows that calcium is seen in a very poor light whereas calcium acetate the data is not that bad it's actually not that bad uh, but coming back to your specific question uh, we use um, uh, cal- non calcium based phosphate binders preferentially but for those with who have low calciums and those who have got uh, financial constraints we use calcium acetate but not calcium carbonate thank you I agree, Sandosh. Basically, this is something like uh, using sulfonyl ureas for controlling diabetes. In India, probably we will have to continue using calcium-based uh, uh, phosphate binders for some more time because the cost of the treatment is coming from the patient's pocket. So, well, you want to control the phosphate. This, that is the most important thing. And then, if it is can be satisfactorily done with the uh, calcium acetate, fine. but all said and done actually the data is like uh, control of phosphorus uh, it's, it's only observational data that the control of phosphorus and uh, reducing the phosphorus level is going to reduce mortality and morbidity if, if that is the clinical hard end point which we are looking at uh, but uh, it is only association there is no causation which has been proved that uh, elevated phosphorus level is going to make uh, uh, increase patient mortality or uh, morbidity so what uh, whatever we are trying to do we are just trying to treat numbers based on some observational data there is no hard uh, clinical data or uh, randomized control trial to make, to tell that a reduction in phosphorus level is going to make difference in uh, patient's outcomes reduction in the phosphorus level and uh, seeing that calcium uh, there is no calcification in the patient is only a soft uh, end point uh, which has been uh, which we are focusing in the end does it make really make a difference in patient's mortality and morbidity it is not very clear Uh, what do you tell santosh sir no uh, i completely agree with you in fact uh, one more point that i wanted to add about that calcium debate is that uh, some of the one of the persons whose data was quoted for making the make, framing of the guideline which we are following her her data was debunked and uh, her uh, her articles were Uh, you know, taken uh, I mean, withdrawn from the withdrawn from publication, and uh, she just about managed to keep her medical license. So there was a lot of uh, you know uh, publication research fraud in some of the data that is out there in with this uh, in this uh, uh, CKD and PD research. And uh, so, without divulging any names, it's all there in the there out. So we have to look at all this some of the stuff with a pinch of salt. We have to. Uh, use what's most pragmatic for our population. Do do we have any more uh, uh, experience uh, to suggest or uh, to share about the use of this and uh, or an advantage or an advantage so that we can all reach some kind of a be on the same page about this about this new drug. to summarize primarily diet control should be the focus to control phosphorus level second uh, after uh, we have exhausted the diet control op- options uh, we have to f- fall back upon non calcium based phosphate binder in case a patient is affording uh, try calcium based phosphate binders in patients who cannot afford and whom in whom calcium is low probably these three would be uh, the basis for managing uh, hyperphosphatemia in patients with uh, uh, ckd on dialysis and i would i be right in saying that most of us feel that uh, this drug could be used either as a de novo or as in or in patients in those who can afford or in patient or as a substitute for other drugs in in those who have difficult to control hyper hyper i mean uh, hyperphosphatemia in either of these situations we could use it depending on our uh, our clinical viewpoint at that particular patient would i be right in saying that that would be what we feel that would be right i think yes yes sir completely agree <laughs> so 
i i don't have anything more to suggest or add if anyone has anything to uh add to our discussion otherwise it's been a it's been a good good lecture that we've had from dr donald i think it was it's very good to listen to you know 45 minutes of all the data that's available on the drug i think that was the highlight of this evening's thing at one snapshot we've got everything everything we wanted it could have been i mean a few hours of reading the journal articles wouldn't have given us so much information so for that i thank uh, the organizers for calling us for this meeting yeah yeah uh, thank you so much santosh sir uh, for moderating today's session and uh, all the panel members who have taken their time and joined uh, i'm sure that uh, listening to professor donald moloney was a wonderful experience and there are certain key messages which we are just summarized now uh, so with this i would like to thank each one of you for uh, joining us today evening and uh, we will keep you posted with upcoming uh, scientific meeting where we can add Uh, value to you and your clinical practice thank you so much and have a nice uh, weekend ahead thank you so much thank you thank you good night and have a nice weekend god bless stay safe thank you